This is the sixth video in a series devoted to an introductory course in proof writing. We just finished doing some stuff with logic, and now we're going to look at counting principles. So in order to get us started with that, we need to define something called a list. So a list is an ordered sequence of objects. We'll use the notation in parentheses like this. So we have A1, A2, A3 up to AN. This is a list of length N. And maybe the third entry in this list would be A1, the second entry would be A sub 2, the nth entry would be A sub N. And I'd like to point out that we will allow repetition as we define our lists. So for example, the list A0, A1 is allowed. That repeats A two times. Now this is in stark contrast to sets. You don't have repeat, repeats of the same elements in sets. Now I'm gonna recall something called the multiplicative principle or the multiplication principle. And I say recall not because we've done it in this course, but because you've likely seen it in the past. And that talks about how many such lists there are given the setup of the situation. So there are m1 times m2 up to mn, so that product of n numbers, such lists of length n if there are mi choices for the ith object. Okay, so let's do some examples of this setup. And the first example will have like a counting tree to kind of see where this multiplication principle comes from. But then after that, we'll just apply this principle. So let's say we want to make a list of three objects. The first object comes from the set containing 0, 1, the second from the set containing A, B, C, and finally the third from the set containing X, Y, Z. So notice we've got two choices, three choices, three choices. So by the multiplication principle, there should be two times three times three or 18 choices. But let's just make sure that makes sense. So let's say we've started having not making any choices at all. So that'll be like our big bang event. The first thing that we'll do is choose whether the first entry is a zero or a one. So that'll give us two branches here. We've got our branch for zero and our branch for one. And at this stage, we've got one entry lists. And those one entry lists are either just zero or one. And now from here, we'll make a choice A, B, C, but that's three choices. So let's see, we'll have a choice A, B, and C. And like I said, that's for all three of these. So where does that leave us? So this would be maybe the choice A, B, C, and then likewise down here, the choice A, B, C. So that'll leave us with zero comma A, zero comma B, and then finally zero comma C, and then same thing here, one comma A, one B, and one C. And next up, we need to make our third choice, and there are three choices for our third choice. They come from X, Y, Z, so that's gonna branch this off three times again. So we'll have three choices here, three choices here, and three choices here, and then likewise, three choices here, three choices here, and three choices here. And so let's say those go as X, Y, Z. Those are the choices, X, Y, Z. And then you can fill in all those other branches as well. So up here, we'll have the list 0, A, X, 0, A, Y, 0, A, Z. And then here we'll have 0, B, X, 0, B, Y, and 0, B, Z. Moving down, we'll have 0, C, X, 0, C, Y, and 0, C, Z. And that's half of them so far. Then the next choice down here will be uh, 1, A, X, 1, A, Y, and 1, A, Z. And then I'll let you fill in the rest. But I think what we can see is that we'll definitely get 18 just based off of these 18 points that we get in the end. So that's kind of a nice illustration that there are 18 such lists. But from here on out, instead of making this like large tree, we'll just use this multiplication principle. 
Okay, let's do another example. So after that basic example, let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Let's say we're trying to choose a four element list or we're trying to count the number of four element lists where the first entry comes from the set containing A and B and the remaining three entries come from the set one, two, three, but we do not allow repetition in this case. So with general lists, we do allow repetition, but sometimes we'll like to not allow repetition. Okay, so the way I like to do this is maybe put an open box for my four choices. Great, and now let's color code this a little bit. So maybe I'll underline this in yellow to show that my first choice comes from that set containing A, B, but then I'll underline this in magenta to show that my second, third, and fourth choices come from the set containing one, two, three without repetition. So now let's count it up. So we can choose from A or B here, so that's two total choices. And then we can choose from one, two, three here, that's three total choices. And you might say, well, here we can also choose from one, two, or three, that'll be three more choices. But that's wrong. And that's wrong because we've already used one of the choices from one, two, three here. So for instance, let's say we chose the number one. Then here we're only allowed to choose two or three. Or if we've chosen here the number two, we're only allowed to choose the number one or three. So as you can see, we have less choices here. We have exactly two choices. But now we've chosen two elements from the set one, two, three, which means we're only left with a single choice for this last bit. So let's maybe match these up. So this matches with that choice, this with that choice, and this with that choice. So putting this all together, we have two times three times two times one or 12. So there are 12 total possibilities. Okay, let's do another. So this next question is about license plates from the state where I live at the moment, which is Virginia. So Virginia license plates consist of three letters followed by four digits. And those digits can be between zero and nine. Now we'd like to decide how many plates are possible. So I'll use like my boxes to indicate choosing letters or numbers. So I need seven boxes for the three letters and then the four numbers. And let's color code this again. So the first three are letters. So that would be this one, this one, and this one whereas the remaining four are digits or numbers between zero and one. So that would be like this box, this box, this box, and this box. And notice there's no rule here about repetition, so we don't have to think too hard about that. Now we've got to choose a letter for here, here, here. How many letters are there? There are 26. So that means we get 26 choices here, 26 choices here, and 26 choices here. And then over there, we need to choose a digit between zero and nine. That gives us 10 possible choices. So we have 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And then you can multiply this all up and you'll see that you get 175,760,000 and that's it. So that's far more cars than you would ever have in the state of Virginia. So now we've got a classic problem about the number of choices on a menu. So let's say a pizzeria offers two types of crust, three sauces, two cheeses, and 10 different toppings. And then our goal is to determine how many four topping pizzas are possible. Okay, so let's see. We'll have a choice for the crust, a choice for the sauce, a choice for the type of cheese, assuming that we're not gonna get two types of cheese or two types of sauce, and then four choices for the toppings. So that means we've got these boxes to fill here. Now let's color code this. So two types of crust, so let's say this yellow box is our choice for crust. Three sauces, let's say this orange box is our choice for sauces two cheeses, let's say this red box is our choice for cheeses, and then finally 10 different toppings, let's say those are our choices for our four toppings that we will choose. So we have this kind of setup. Now we can apply this multiplication principle. 
So there are two types of crust. So there are two choices for this box. There are three sauces. So there are three choices for this next box. Two cheeses. There are two choices for this next box. And then 10 different toppings. So for the first topping, we can choose 10 different objects. Then for the next topping, we can't choose 10 anymore because we've already chosen one. Let's just say that doubling up on a topping is not possible. So if you've already chosen, for example, mushrooms for your first topping, you're not allowed to choose mushrooms for the second topping. So that means there are only nine choices for the second topping and similarly eight for the third and seven for the fourth. So now we can take the product of all of those and what we'll see is that there are 60,480 total pizzas. Okay, so now let's do a quick follow-up problem and that will be how many pizzas are there with four or less toppings? Well, we just decided that the number with four toppings was this 60,000. So all we need to do here is determine the number with three toppings, two toppings, one topping, or zero topping, a plain cheese pizza, and then add those together. So I think we can do that without maybe doing our graphic, just motivated by what's going on here. So if we're choosing three toppings, it's like filling up all of these boxes except for the last one, which means we have this product here without the seven. So that would be two times three times two times 10 times nine times eight. You can multiply that up and you'll see that you get 8,640. Now let's move on to two topping pizzas. Then that's like filling up all of these boxes except for the last two, because we only want two toppings. So that means it's doing this entire product except for the eight times seven. So we have two times three times two times 10 times nine. And you can multiply that up and you'll see that you get 1,080. And then how many one topping pizzas and how many zero topping pizzas? So likewise for one topping pizzas, we have two times three times two times 10, which multiplies up to 120 different pizzas. And for zero topping pizzas, we have two times three times two, because we don't make any topping choices. And that will be 12 total pizzas. But now if we add all of this together, we need to add these four numbers along with this number right here for four toppings, you'll see that we have 70,332 total pizzas with four or fewer toppings. And this example actually brings us to another principle that instead of called the multiplication principle is the addition principle. So let's look at that. So now we're gonna formally write down the principle that we just used and that's called the addition principle. So let's suppose we have a finite set, we'll call it A, and it can be expressed as a disjoint union. So what I mean by that is we can write A as A1 union A2 union all the way up to AN, where AI intersect AJ is the empty set unless I is equal to J. So that means if these are not equal indices, we get this intersection is empty. Then the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of A1 plus the cardinality of A2 all the way up to the cardinality of AN. So let's notice that we definitely used that in the previous example. Our set A would have been all pizzas with four or less toppings and we broke that down into pizzas with exactly four, exactly three, exactly two, exactly one, or zero toppings. So let's look at our next example. We want to determine how many five digit multiples of five there are that contain exactly one nine. So we can break this up into four disjoint possibilities. So I'll draw these in this like rectangle shape. And those possibilities depend on exactly where that single nine happens. The single nine could be the first entry and then after that we have four more digits to choose. The single nine could be the second digit, and then we have one before and three after to choose. The single nine could be in the middle, or finally, the single nine could be not quite at the end, but it could be the next to last digit. You might say, well, why can't that single digit be the last digit? 
And that's because these are all multiples of five and multiples of five only end in zero and one. So I'll shade this in right here just to collect the information that these have to be multiples of five. So that means they end in either a zero or a one. So now let's see what we have here for our choices. So this is a nine. We're only supposed to have exactly one nine. So how many choices do we have to fill in the rest? Oh, we'll have nine choices here, nine choices here, and nine choices here, and then two choices here. That's because this is allowed to be anything except for nine. So zero through eight. This is allowed to be zero through eight, zero through eight. This is allowed to be zero or five. So in the end, we have nine times nine times nine times two. That's the number of possibilities for those two cases. Now these other two are slightly different. So this first entry is allowed to be one through eight. It can't be equal to zero because then we would have a four digit number instead of a five digit number. So this can be one through eight, that gives us eight possibilities. Then this can be zero through eight, zero through eight, so that's nine possibilities, nine possibilities, and then two possibilities. But then that's similar for each of these. We just have the product in a slightly different order. But we could write it all down as eight times nine times nine times two, eight times nine times nine times two. Okay, so in the end, how many possibilities are there? Well, there's the sum of those four numbers. But let's notice we can factor a nine times nine times two out of the whole thing. That's 81 times two. 81 times two is 186. So in fact, we really have 186, and then plus eight, plus eight, plus eight, so that's 24, plus nine, so that is 33. So the final answer is 186 times 33. I'll let you do the final calculation if you'd like to. Okay, so now that we've looked at the addition principle and the multiplication principle, let's look at the subtraction. Now we're ready to look at something called the subtraction principle. So let's say we have a finite universal set, which I'll call U. Then the cardinality of A complement is the same thing as the cardinality of U minus the cardinality of A. So let's see that counting principle in example. So our goal now is to find how many phone numbers contain at least one eight. So let's maybe recall the shape of phone numbers, at least if you're living in the US. So they look like this. You have an area code, so that would have three choices right here. And then you have a prefix, which is three more choices. And then you have the suffix, which is four choices. And I don't know the precise rules. Perhaps you're not allowed to start with a zero, but we're not gonna worry about the precise rules here just to simplify the game. And since I don't know them. So let's just assume we have 10 choices for all of these entries. Maybe post in the comments if you know what the rules are and you can talk about what the real number is based on those rules. So we've got 10 choices for each of these 10 possibilities. Okay, so I'm gonna first of all like just sketch out the way that you might do this without using the subtraction principle. You could break this into the following possibilities. So we want at least one eight. So you could break it down into exactly one eight, exactly two eights, exa exactly three eights, and then so on and so forth, up to really just all eights. But I think we can, achieve, we can all agree that that's gonna be a little bit too much work. So maybe we could do something different. And let's notice that having exactly one eight is disjoint from having zero eights. And in fact, it's the complement of having zero eights. So what we could really do here is the following calculation. So all possible, phone numbers minus the phone numbers without eight. So phone numbers without eights. Notice if we were to perform this calculation, we would get exactly what we want. We would get the number of phone numbers with at least one eight. Okay, but I think we can pretty easily calculate all possible phone numbers. We've got, we've got 10 possibilities for each of these 10 choices. So that would be 10 to the 10 
But now if we're not allowing eights, then we're allowing zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. So that'll be nine possibilities, but we're making 10 choices. So it would be 10 to the 10 minus nine to the 10. But you can calculate this out and it's actually quite large. It's 6,513,215,000. 599. So, that, so that's the number of phone numbers that contain at least one eight. Now we're going to look at a very special case of this multiplication principle, which we actually saw in practice. And that is the notion of a K permutation. So let's look at the definition. A K permutation of an N element set is a list of K elements from this set without repetition then we can easily calculate that the number of K permutations from this N element set is, we'll use the notation P of N K. So it's the product N times N minus one times N minus two ending at N minus K plus one. So let's talk our way through that real quick. So we're trying to make a list of length K from N element set. For our first choice, we have N possibilities. For that second choice, we have n minus one possibilities. That's because we've already used up one of the possibilities. For the third choice, we have n minus two possibilities. Again, because we've used up two possibilities, so on and so forth. Way down here for the kth choice is n minus k plus one possibilities. Now I'd like to point out that sometimes the notation is this n with an underlined k. That's called a falling power. I don't think that's in the textbook that I'm using for the course, but you might see this somewhere. And then furthermore, if K is between zero and N, then there's like this nice more closed formula, which is PNK is N factorial over N minus K factorial. Okay, let's look at an example. Let's say you deal five cards from a standard 52 card deck. Then your goal is to determine how many such uh, dealings or how many such hands or possibilities are there that all of them are red cards or all of them are clubs. So let's recall that half of the cards are red cards. So that means there are 26 red cards. So we're thinking about our set as our set is containing 26 cards. And then we want to choose five of them from that set. And so this is like taking a five permutation from a 26 element set. So that means we get P 26, five. So that's clearly gonna be 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22. Great. And then what about all clubs? So there are four suits in a deck and each suit has 13 cards. So that means we wanna choose five cards from that 13 card set. So that means we want to do the number of permutations 13, five. So that'll be 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times nine. But then notice that these two are disjoint. If you choose all red cards, you won't choose a club because clubs are black cards. And that means that we can just use the addition rule to find out our total possibilities. So our total possibilities, like I said, will be the sum of these two numbers, which turns out to be 8,048,040. So those are how many possible dealings there are like this. Okay, so it's time to leave you with some warm-up exercises. So here are two nice warm-up exercises. So the first has to do with eight-digit binary strings. So those will be lists with eight digits where each of the entries are either zero or one. So our goal is to count them under the following different possibilities. So the first is how many are there with no restrictions at all? Second, how many of them have zero as their second, fourth, and seventh digit? Next, how many have zero as their second, fourth, or seventh digit? And then finally, last, how many of them contain at least one one? Then for the last problem, let's